In this video, we continue our discussion of how the 2016 movie Split portrays dissociative identity disorder with Dr. Richard Day, an abnormal psychology professor at McMaster University. They are what they believe they are. The brain has learned to defend itself. You treat them like they're supernaturally gifted, like, like they have powers or something. Karen, these are patients. They have been through trauma. And perhaps now they are capable of something we are not. We have brain scans now. DID patients have changed their body chemistry with their thoughts. Is Dr. Fletcher's description of DID accurate in this scene? She doesn't give a complete explanation, but she's, she's talking about the, the standard way in which DID is in fact viewed. Uh, she, she mentions the trauma dissociation model, essentially. Uh, this talk about special powers, I'm really not really sure what the heck she's talking about there, but it, it's nice and dramatic and so on. Uh, but by and large, it's, it seems a reasonable description. Can individuals with DID change their physiological characteristics? Yes. Let me give you a, let me give you a very dramatic example. Uh, we're, we're, uh, the number of differences between alters that has been reported in the literature is, is enormous. Different allergies, uh, a different uh, visual acuity, uh, you name it. But there was a particular case I shared, in fact, with the, my class just the other day. It's a German case study that was reported in 2015. Uh, an individual who'd been in treatment for uh, DID for a number of years, and he was blind. All of the altars were blind. And so he'd come, he'd come with a, a cane and a seeing eye dog to every single session. But then suddenly, during one session, he began to be able to see. One of the altars began to be able to, it was a teenage boy, I think it was an altar. Uh, this was a male case, I believe. Uh, teenage boy began to see whole words on a magazine in the doctor's office. Couldn't see the individual letters, but he could see whole words. And then little by little, over time, and again with suggestion from the therapist, he was able to see the words, he was able to read things, and pretty soon that particular altar could, could see perfectly well. Other altars could not. Now you might think, okay, well you can fake blindness. You've got a whole bunch of alters who are pretending they can't see, and you've got a guy who can see. Well, what they did in this study, which is made, what made it particularly interesting, is they took readings off the visual cortex of the, the host and the, the altars. Some of the altars who could not see, some of the altars, and some of the altars who could. And th there is a, a brain response to a visual stimulus called an evoked response pattern. It's a little blip of electrical activity when a visual stimulus is first presented. And it's an indication that the brain is receiving this information is going to do something with it. And the interesting thing they found was that in the in the sighted altar, you got that little blip when you presented a, uh, a visual stimulus to it. But in the blind altars, there was nothing. The brain was not responding in the normal way to visual stimuli in the blind altar. So their brain was acting as though they were blind functionally. And of course they were. I mean, from from the point of view of their conscious experience, they could not see because the brain was not passing the information it had on to consciousness. Little by little, according to the report, I, I'm sure another word will come up, uh, more and more of the altars began to see <laughs> over, the, over the course of time. And eventually, we're going to, I assume, uh, we'll have a situation where all of them uh, are, in fact, uh, not visually impaired. Because he'd, they'd been, he'd been diagnosed with, with cortical blindness uh, over the years, and uh, apparently it was something much more dramatic and interesting than that. So yes, you, they, they certainly can alter their physiology. I mean, different drug reactions, uh, different allergies with different alters. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. I hate my insulin shots. No one else around here has to take them. Why do I have to have diabetes? All the doctors, besides Dr. Fletcher, say that we're the same person, just personalities. Huh? How do you explain I'm the only one that needs these, you mother... Is this physiological difference between alters possible? Can one really need insulin while others don't? I've never read a, 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 that particular difference, but it wouldn't surprise me if there were cases where that would happen, because again, the body can determine the release of hormones, which determine the release of other chemicals, and it would not surprise me if that were in some in fact possible, whether or not it's ever been reported. I haven't seen a report like that. But. I believe that this brought up issues from when you were a child and abused. Sometimes another incident of abuse can cause suppressed personalities to take the light. 
Is abuse a realistic cause of DID? It's, it's hard to say. It's, it's the most widely accepted view. Uh, but there are severe critics on the other side who say no. In fact, if you look at it, 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 in the original model said any trauma whatsoever can cause dissociation and, and the formation of multiple personalities of DID. Uh, it's, it's been narrowed down now uh, to primarily childhood sexual abuse because there's so it's difficult to find cases uh, in, in uh, uh, in many cases, in individuals who severe, suffered severe trauma where they have forgotten, right? And then it's led to the development of dissociative symptomatology. And it's still debated as to whether or not these recovered memories of childhood abuse that typically show up in therapy, again, under hypnosis, uh, are really accurate representations of what the individual has experienced or whether or not they're suggested by the therapist. Could you possibly have been abused as a child? And then let's, let's, let's do some hypnotic therapy and see if you remember any of these things. Well, uh, the, the reason that hypnotically induced testimony isn't uh, allowed in most courtrooms in the world is that it's not reliable. It, it is the case that uh, under hypnosis, people do recall a lot more true details of events, but unfortunately they recall an, a larger number of untrue details about things. And so their overall accuracy goes down. So it's hard to say. This is the what you're seeing is the prevailing view, in fact, about DID. But it's uh, controversial to say the least. I want to talk about Kevin and what his mother did to him. I remember it all. I'm happy you're suddenly so open. Kevin's mother had rather malevolent ways of punishing a three-year-old. Is that when you arrived in the light? Yeah. The one way to avoid her attention was to keep everything spotless, everything perfect. I know you're coming from good intentions, Dennis, but there are other ways to help Kevin now. Is it possible for alters to be protective of the host? Absolutely. And in fact, there are a number of the altars do tend to be de the people who defend the host against various kinds of problems. Again, some of the animal altars tend to be of that sort. Uh, very often, the non-human altars are rather ferocious animal bears, tigers, lions, and so on, uh, whose function in the individual's life is to, to show up when there's danger and risk and, and to behave in a very assertive, even aggressive manner in order to protect the host. At least that's the way it's presented, yes. Dr. Fletcher, who did that? You did? I swear I was on a bus. I don't remember anything after that. I... This is still September 18, 2014, right? Is it realistic that Kevin cannot remember anything? That's not impossible given, again, given the various ways in which uh, uh, these symptoms present. And it's, there's also a separate dissociative disorder called dissociative amnesia, which does exactly have these characteristics. Now, in the case, and it's actually far more common than dissociative identity disorder, and it involves uh, an individual coming to and realizing there's a period of time, usually, usually just a few hours, that they don't remember what they've done or anything. Uh, a few dramatic cases which make the media are cases where individuals don't remember things for days at a time. And they may, in the case of dissociative amnesia with fugue, they may end up hundreds or thousands of miles away from their original home a year or two later, having started a new job, a new family and so on, and then poof, they suddenly remember the old life that they left. Um, those are extremely rare cases, but they have been reported uh, over the years uh, from time to time. Are individuals with DID typically violent? No. Uh, again, they're, they're usually very vulnerable people, and that's the reason they have... This is the notion, again, we don't really know. This, this is the notion they've retreated inside themselves to kind of protect against these horrible memories of, of abuse or trauma in childhood. So rather than being aggressive, they tend to be quite the opposite. They tend to be rather reticent. And, and there will be an altar who will have to stand up for them when there's a... a, a for example, if a conflict begins, a particular altar, a protector altar may show up and, and be, be more assertive than the host would have been in the same circumstance and so on. So no, uh, violence would not normally be a part of uh, any of these individuals' lives.